as you can see, uh, we're uh, back to discuss uh, session two, which is on applying the breakthrough therapy criteria in oncology. As you heard earlier, this has been one of the primary areas of breakthrough designation uh, requests and uh, um, uh, grants and activity so far. Um, we're going to try to build on session one, which presented a, a really uh, interesting and timely overview of how the breakthrough designation program is operating overall. But again, as we discussed in that session, there are a lot of issues that are um, uh, therapeutic area specific that uh, uh, involve uh, um, uh, multiple factors that, uh, with a limited amount of uh, actual data so far that these case studies can hopefully make a big difference in helping to understand how the criteria are being applied and what some of the issues are as uh, uh, in further clarifying the, the program going forward. So over the next three sessions, we're going to look more specifically about the, at uh, how Breakthrough is operating across a range of therapeutic areas, starting with uh, the most common area for applying Breakthrough designation so far in oncology. Uh, and uh, here we have, have uh, three case studies that will help frame our discussion. Uh, FDA is going to be pre presenting this case studies, as John mentioned in the first session, using the kind of approach that reflects what FDA is doing internally uh, through this uh, CEDAR-wide process with, uh, uh, with medical policy to uh, get to uh, uh, an, a uh, decision. And uh, then we're going to have comments from uh, the, uh, uh, the, the companies that have been involved as well. So the case studies include uh, Ariad Pharmaceuticals uh, a case and a Merck Sharp and Dome case, uh, similar to the manner in which they were presented at the FDA Medical Policy Council. Uh, then there's going to be one of those hypothetical denials, which is based on, uh, as you heard, a considerable amount of experience now uh, with uh, breakthrough therapy denials, which will provide an example of what would not qualify for the designation. Uh, and then we're going to hear from the companies involved and from some other perspectives uh, on uh, how uh, breakthrough is operating and uh, potential next steps in this area. So uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists first, uh, and then I'll turn it over over to our uh, uh, to Jenny for the the case presentation, uh, the first case presentation. So uh, uh, going uh, uh, so Jenny Chang is a medical officer in the division of oncology products two uh, at FDA. Uh, next to uh, uh, Den uh, Jenny uh, uh, is, is uh, Deco Kazanjan, who's a medical officer in the division of on oncology products two uh, as well. Uh, next to uh, uh, DECO is uh, Mark Therio, who's the clinical team lead at the Division of Oncology Products to, uh, for FDA. Uh, next to Mark is Ellen Siegel, uh, my uh, very good friend and the chairperson and founder of the Friends of Cancer Research, Research and somebody who's been involved in uh, breakthrough designation before it was uh, breakthrough designation. Uh, next to Ellen is uh, uh, Rich Moshiki, who's the Deputy Director for Science Operations at uh, CEDAR uh, at FDA. And then uh, to my left, uh, Eric Rubin, Vice President for Clinical Research at Merck, uh, and David Kirsten the medical director for clinical research at Ariad Pharmaceuticals, uh, and uh, George uh, Dimitri, a professor of medicine uh, at Harvard Medical School. So thank you all for being here to provide your perspectives. And Jenny, I'll turn to you for the first presentation today, the first case study presentation on Keftruda from Merck. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jenny Chang, and I'm a clinical reviewer in the Office of Hematology and Oncology Products at the FDA. I'd like to thank the Brookings uh, Institute for the invitation um, for the opportunity to speak to you today about the case study that I reviewed uh, for breakthrough therapy designation, uh, pembrolizumab, for the treatment of patients with unresectable or metastatic melanoma. And pembrolizumab is also known as MK3475 and uh, its trade name is Keytruda. The um, sponsor here is Merck. And for those trivia enthusiasts out there, uh, this was the first breakthrough therapy that was granted in um, the Office of Hematology and Oncology Products. 
So uh, before I delve into the case study, we'd like to give you a brief background on metastatic melanoma and the therapies, as this is helpful for understanding the framework and considerations that went into the breakthrough therapy uh, designation decision. So first off, uh, metastatic melanoma is a serious uh, and life-threatening condition. It's the fifth most common cancer in men and the seventh in women. It's a serious disease with a five-year survival of around 15%. And as you can see, the FDA-approved therapies for unresectable or metastatic melanoma are limited. The therapies listed here are categorized according to those with or without the BRAF V600 mutation, which is a biomarker for melanoma. In unselected patients, the treatment options here are interleukin-2 or IL-2, decarbazine, and ipilimumab, um, which I'll refer to here as IPI. Uh, in this presentation. So IL-2 was um, approved in 1992, decarbazine in uh, 1975, and IPI was more recently approved in 2011. The overall response rates vary between 10 to 20 percent for these Asian agents. And for ipilimumab, the median duration response was 11.5 months. So the therapies on the right side of the slide consist of agents targeting the BRAF V600 mutation and are approved for patients uh, using the FDA-approved test who test positively for it. This constitutes approximately 50% of melanoma patients, and these drugs include vemurafenib, dibrafenib, and trametinib, and um, the combination of the dibrafenib and trametinib. So their overall response rates are higher as these are targeted agents. And um, so uh, for the combination of the dibrafenib and trametinib, we're looking at 76%, and for vemurafenib, it's 48%. And um, ipilimumab and vemurafenib have demonstrated an overall survival in this patient population. So, um, and also to note that trametinib and dibrafenib were not approved at the time of the um, breakthrough th therapy designation request. So, but they're here just um, as uh, for your um, information. So, um, let's see here. Moving on to the next slide. Um, I will discuss the specifics of the pembrolizumab breakthrough therapy designation request. So Merck had submitted the request in November 2012 for the following two indications. The treatment of unresectable or metastatic melanoma that is refractory to ipilimumab treatment and the treatment of unresectable or metastatic melanoma in patients who have not received um, IPI, prior IPI. And to give you a brief background on pembrolizumab is a human monoclonal IgG4 antibody that blocks the interaction between PD-1 and PD-L1 uh, and PD-L2, which are the ligands. The blockade enhances the functional activity of target lymphocytes to facilitate tumor regression and immune rejection. The PD-1 pathway is a major immune control switch that may be engaged by ligand tumor expression in tumor microenvironment to overcome active anti-tumor specific T cell immune surveillance. So the high expression of PDL1, the ligand for PD1, on tumor cells has been found to correlate with a poor prognosis and survival in various cancers. The, the observed correlation of clinical prognosis with PDL1 expression in multiple cancers suggests that the PD1 and PDL1 pathway play a critical role in tumor evasion. So the, ba break, the basis for this breakthrough request is the P001 study, which was submitted to the FDA as an investigational new drug application in December 2010. The P001 study was a dose escalation study followed by cohort expansions into melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer. The focus of the breakthrough request was a Part B cohort, which consisted of patients with um, melanoma. So the objective of the study was to evaluate the safety and anti-tumor activity of pembrolizumab in patients with locally advanced and metastatic melanoma. And um, the patient population was restricted to those who were either IPI-naive or IPI-treated. And patients who were BRAF mutant must have had been treated with uh, BRAF or a MEK inhibitor. 
So in the Part B cohort, we looked at two dose levels at uh, two mg per kg every three weeks and 10 mg per kg every three weeks. <clears throat> So this slide uh, presents the results to substantiate the rationale for the breakthrough request. The Part B cohort consisted of 85 patients, as you can see here, with melanoma, 58 who were IPI naive, and 27 who had prior treatment with IPI. These results were based on an independent centralized review of radiographic imaging with a data cutoff of December 2012. And for the purposes of this designation, resist criteria was used to assess response. The overall response rate in melanoma, all melanoma patients, was 40%. In the IPI naive, the response rate was 43% and was slightly lower in the IPI treated at 33%. So as you can see, only a handful of patients had a complete response, two in the IPI naive and one in the IPI pretreated. The complete, uh, the response rates were still ongoing at the time of the breakthrough submission. Therefore, only the ranges are presented here, and uh, you can see that there's an eight-month, um, up to an eight-month duration in patients who were IPI naive and four months, approximately four months in the IPI treated. This slide illustrates the Kaplan-Meier estimates of response duration by prior IPI treatment. So the IPI treated uh, patients are represented by the red line and the IPI naive by the black line. And you can see on this slide that there was a significant number of patients still responding, albeit the duration was ongoing at the time of submission. And this was regardless of the prior treatment history with ipilimumab. So in addition to the efficacy, we also looked at the safety profile. And the most common adverse events observed in patients receiving pembrolizumab, regardless of attribution, were fatigue, nausea, rash, diarrhea, cough, pruritus, arthralgias, and headaches. Grade three or four AEs, regardless of attribution, were 27% and the incidence of immune-related adverse events as reported by investigators was 16%. So at the time of the breakthrough request, there were seven cases of immune-related grade three or four adverse events that we looked at, which were reported by investigators. These events included interstitial nephritis, pleuritic pain, pancytopenia, pneumonia, or pneumonitis, abdominal pain and vomiting, hyperthyroidism, and hypothyroidism. These adverse events were also uh, observed in, with IPI treated and are consistent with the safety profile um, that we know that's observed in immune-related therapies. Uh, there were two fatal adverse events. A case of pneumonia or pneumonitis was reported as a possible treatment-related death, and a case of abdominal pain and vomiting was in the setting of rapid disease progression and disease-related death. Except for these two cases, all others improved or resolved with supportive care and treatment with corticosteroids. So, Based on the results of the Part B cohort of the P001 study, which consists of patients who are IPI naive and IPI treated, and the review of the current therapies as I presented earlier at the time of the breakthrough submission, FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation for the proposed indications on January 2013, based on the following, that pembrolizumab is uh, intended to treat a serious disease, melanoma here, and the division determined that the preliminary evidence from the P001 study indicated that pembrolizumab may demonstrate a substantial improvement over existing therapies for melanoma based on the high rate of responses ranging from 33 to 43%, with a prolonged duration of response of four to eight months in the IPI naive and IPI treated patient population. So just to close out and to give you an update, I'm sure all of you um, already know that pembrolizumab was actually granted accelerated approval last year on September 4th for the treatment of patients with unresectable and metastatic mel melanoma and di disease progression following ipilimumab and if um, patients had a BRAF V600 mutation, a BRAF inhibitor. 
So this accelerated approval was based on the Part B2 cohort of patients, a sub-cohort of what I presented. And the overall response rate was 24% with a duration of response of um, up to eight months ongoing at the time of the approval. And these patients were treated at two mg per kg every three weeks, uh, which is the approved dose. And um, the application actually was under priority review when it came in um, as a rolling submission. So that's it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jenny, for that concise presentation. As I said, we're going to go through the three present, uh, case presentations first, then uh, open to discussion. So uh, next up is uh, Deco on uh, Borgatinib from Ariad Pharmaceuticals. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, to begin with, I wanted to just take one second um, for a moment of silence. Actually, today marks the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, where a million and a half Armenians perished, and which was 80% of the population. So, uh, so as was introduced, my name is Diko Kazanjan. I'm one of the medical officers um, in the Division of Oncology Products 2 in CEDAR. And I'll be doing the case review of brigatinib, which is indicated for the treatment of patients with anaplastic lymphoma kinase positive, non-small cell lung cancer that is resistant to prizotinib. So to give you a background on non-small cell lung cancer, the standard first-line treatments um, of metastatic disease in an unselected population includes platinum doublets, as you can see on my slide, that gives you, at best, the response rates of about 30 percent, progression-free survivals of about five months, and overall survivals of 10 months. In the second-line setting, um, in general, there's even um, less options in the unselected population, which mainly involves the um, approved drugs, pemetrexid and docetaxel, along with uh, ramucirumab. And there you can see the even um, m more marginal response rates of of approximately 9%. To give you a background on ALK positive non small cell lung cancer, it's um, a subtype that is present in only about 5% of non small cell lung cancer cases. And the standard of care actually is to test um, for predictive um, biomarkers in non small cell lung cancer, specifically EGFR and ALK alterations. And those who may have an ALK alteration, first-line treatment would be crizotinib, um, which does have regular approval by the FDA. And in the second-line setting, meaning those patients who progress on crizotinib um, can be treated with seritinib, which has um, acceler accelerated approval as of April 2014. So crizotinib resistance. Invariably, patients' tumors will eventually develop resistance to first-line crizotinib. The figure on the left demonstrates the known causes of secondary resistance, including development of gatekeeper mutations in ALK itself and activation of the EGFR pathway. The figure on the right demonstrates that unlike the sole T790M story in EGFR mutation-positive non-small cell lung cancer, a variety of secondary gatekeeper mutations exist in ALK. Newer second generation ALK inhibitors target a variety of these gatekeepers. Brigatinib by Ariad is one of these second generation ALK inhibitors. The proposed indication is for treatment of patients with ALK positive metastatic non small cell lung cancer that is resistant or intolerant to crizotinib. As seen on the figure on the right, brigatinib has varying ability to inhibit different gatekeeper mutations found in ALK positive crizotinib refractory non-small cell lung cancer. Brigatinib is being studied in a combined phase 1-2 study, which is currently ongoing. The phase 1 portion was designed to determine the randomized phase 2 dose. The phase 2 portion involved enrolling patients into five different cohorts, varying on specific eligibility. The relevant cohorts to the proposed indication included cohort one for ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer determined by FISH testing, 
who had not previously received tyrosine kinase inhibitory treatment. The second cohort involved patients with ALK positive non small cell lung cancer, again determined by FISH, whose tumors had progressed while receiving crizotinib. And the cohort five included patients with ALK positive non small cell lung cancer who had active and measurable brain metastasis. Ariad's general investigation and development plan involved supporting an accelerated approval submission using an uncontrolled randomized 2 2 dose clinical study clinical study in patients who have progressed on previous treatment with crizotinib. This would be supported by the ongoing earlier phase one multi-cohort study. Ariad plans on eventually confirming the benefit risk of brigatinib in a randomized phase three trial, comparing it to crizotinib in the first line setting. This trial might be a component of a proposed NCI CTEP multi-arm master protocol. Given the initial results of the phase 1-2 study, Ariad submitted an initial breakthrough designation request. The table shows the results which were submitted to FDA. Row 2 demonstrates the results of the most appropriate patients representing the proposed indication of treatment of patients after crizotinib failure. As you can see, 16 patients were evaluable with an overall response rate of 75%. There were no complete responses and there were five confirmed partial responses. The breakthrough designation was denied. FDA concluded that while the results were indicative of drug activity, an insufficient number of patients was studied and the follow-up was insufficient to determine duration of response. Approximately a year later, with the increase in clinical experience of brigatinib, Ariad contacted FDA about the submitting updated data from the phase 1-2 study, now with data from 57 evaluable ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer patients. FDA at that time encouraged the submission, which was resubmitted three months later. The table below represents the updated clinical experience and efficacy of brigatinib. The submission included a total of 125 patients with a variety of diagnoses. Of the 61 non-small cell lung cancer patients who were previously treated with crizotinib, the proposed indication, 51 were evaluable. Of these 51 evaluable patients, 35 patients had a response, making the overall response rate 69%. More conservatively, if we include the 10 non-evaluable patients in the denominator and use only confirmed responses, the overall response rate is 43%. In addition, the overall response rate was 100% in the six patients who received brigatinib as first-line treatment for ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer. There was adequate follow-up time to get a sense of the duration of responses, the range being from 1.6 to 14.7 months. The tables here show the safety profile thus far seen with brigatinib. Common toxicities to this agent and many other tyrosine kinase inhibitors include nausea, fatigue, and diarrhea, and did not represent any particular safety signal. However, the most concerning potential toxicity was pulmonary related. 10% of patients experienced some pulmonary symptom as defined by dyspnea, hypoxia, cough, chest tightness, pneumonia, or pneumonitis. Furthermore, pulmonary toxicity is attributed to serious adverse events ranging from 2 to 7%. Dyspnea at 7% had the highest incidence. FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation given that non-small cell lung cancer is a serious and deadly disease with high unmet medical need. Furthermore, the prelim preliminary anti-cancer activities suggest a substantial magnitude of benefit over available therapies. In this indication of post crizotinib treated ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer, there are no drugs which have received regular approval. Seritinib does have the same indication, however, it has received accelerated approval only and is not considered available therapy. As data continues to be collected, the safety profile, especially in the context of pulmonary adverse events, will have to be further characterized. 7% of patients had dyspnea alone as a serious adverse event. However, given that this is single arm data, it is difficult to conclude on whether the cause is from the drug, disease, or both. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Zico. So uh, next presentation is of the hypothetical denial case uh, by Mark uh, Theore. <clears throat> OK, 
Okay, good morning, everyone. My name, as mentioned, is Mark Thierry. I'm a medical oncologist and also the clinical team leader for the melanoma sarcoma team in the Division of Oncology Products II in OHA. And I was tasked today with presenting a hypothetical denial case, as mentioned earlier. And the proposed indication for this hypothetical uh, case is the product, Hypothetics, uh, for the treatment of advanced unresectable or metastatic cancers of the hypothetical gland. <laughs> so <laughs> this is, in fact, not a case, a real case that was anonymized um, in various fashions. It's really an amalgam to present various points of denials based on our experience. So hypothetical malignant glandularomas, uh, HMG, because I cannot pronounce that uh, very well throughout the whole presentation, is a heterogeneous group of solid tumors. And in 2014, there were 80,000 new cases with approximately 20,000 uh, deaths due to HMG in the US with a grim five-year survival as depicted up here. Treatment options for advanced uh, unresectable or metastatic disease include uh, essentially single agent chemotherapeutics of which none have demonstrated an improvement in overall survival. So in terms of the FDA-approved therapies for HMG, uh, there are two, Chemotherapy X, which was approved in the 1970s based upon tumor response rates of approximately 10%. Um, and then more recently, which was still approximately 20 years ago, Chemotherapy Y, which was compared to Chemotherapy X in a randomized trial and did demonstrate an improvement in the uh, progression-free survival listed up here as time to tumor growth. Just for the non-oncologists in the audience, progression-free survival, which I'll refer to, is essentially the time from the uh, start of the study until the tumor gets larger above a certain threshold or there's a death due to any cause. And you can see an improvement from approximately three and a half months, uh, uh, from 1.5 months to three and a half months uh, with chemotherapy Y with response rates with chemotherapy Y approximately 20% compared to the uh, previously approved drug chemotherapy X of 8% with durations or responses of five months. So in terms of the mechanism of action or rationale, uh, the uh, hypothetics is a monoclonal antibody in this case that binds to the HMG associated protein X and blocks the interaction with its ligand HMG XL. And blocking the interaction of this uh, protein uh, essentially will modulate downstream signaling events. And in vitro, the hypothetics does decrease proliferation of HMG cell lines. And in vivo, in xenograft model, models, there is a substantially enhanced effect on the anti tumor responses with the addition of chemotherapy Y. So the preliminary clinical data to support this breakthrough request uh, is, as shown, comes from an open-label international uh, randomized controlled trial in patients with unresectable and or metastatic HMG. And they were randomized in a two-to-one fashion to receive the chemotherapy Y essentially with or without hypothetics. And you can see the total accrual there. Uh, the planned uh, was approximately 80 patients in the combination group with 40 patients in the single agent chemotherapy group with a primary endpoint of progression-free survival. Secondary endpoints were other measures of anti-tumor activity, such as tumor response rates, duration of tumor responses, and overall survival. And these are the results. So with the combination, uh, which is the middle column, the uh, Progression-free survival median was approximately 5.5 months and compared to the single agent chemotherapy arm of 2.7 months with a hazard ratio of, of 0 0.60, thus favoring the combination arm. And the tumor response rate with the combination was 20%, whereas on the single agent arm, there was uh, a zero uh, response rate. And as you can see, uh, the duration of responses was 7.3 months with the combination. And in terms of the uh, overall survival analysis, there was no difference between the groups in overall survival. 
However, on subgroup analyses, uh, retrospective testing to identify patients with HMG XXL, which was a high affinity variant of the ligand, in approximately 25% of patients, demonstrated a median improvement in time in the progression-free survival of eight months with a similar tumor response rate with the hypothetics combo. And the time to tumor response analyses based on the known prognostic factors for uh, patients with HMG were not consistently in favor of the hypothetics arm. And this is a presentation of the safety. As this is an add-on trial, you can see that the toxicities, uh, I've selected some here for you, uh, with the combination are increased. Uh, this is all grades, and I can say that the grade three, four events were also increased for neutropenia and diarrhea um, of greater than 5% uh, compared to the chemotherapy arm. So the division's recommendations based on this preliminary clinical data was denial. The preliminary clinical evidence does not demonstrate substantial improvement over existing therapies. Uh, although a, re a large relative effect on PFS, uh, the absolute magnitude was relatively small. Subset analysis uh, were retrospective and based on a small convenience sample in terms of the high affinity ligand uh, variant. And this was an add-on trial design such that the PFS improvement here uh, must be balanced uh, in the context of the increased toxicities. And as you can see, based on the historical data that I presented for chemotherapy-wide, the control arm underperformed. So the division's advice to the sponsor was to conduct a new trial stratifying for the presence of the high affinity uh, ligand and allocating appropriate alpha for this subgroup in the analysis and to meet with CDRH, which is the Center for Device and Radiological Health, uh, regarding the validation of the HMG XXL assay. And we present this hypothetical case as an example of a drug that does demonstrate uh, potentially a modest effect on progression-free survival with potentially acceptable toxicity profile that warrants further consideration for development, but was not granted based upon not reaching the substantial improvement in review of the totality of the data. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, Mark, I want to thank you and your team for putting together a, a very uh, plausible uh, um, and, and rich uh, case study, plausible, I guess, in every effect, except the drug name was way too pronounceable, a hypothetics. <laughs> isn't it? The, uh, um, I would like to turn first to the um, leaders from the companies that were involved in the non-hypothetical cases that we just discussed, uh, Eric and, uh, and David, uh, for your perspective on the, the breakthrough experience that you had and, and uh, uh, where uh, um, there might be opportunities for more clarifications or uh, um, improving the program, or just, or just your, uh, your, your, you know, any key points from your experience. So uh, Eric, maybe I'll start with you, since uh, you got into the breakthrough therapy designation process really at the, at the beginning when this, uh, when this program uh, was starting. So uh, your perspective on um, uh, how you approached it and, uh, and what difference it made. Thanks, Mark. So as you know, the timing was actually very good for us. So having participated in um, preceding, the preceding Brookings Friends of Cancer Research meeting where this was discussed, we had, a, I think, a sense of what the FDA was looking for. And in our protocol one, um, as noted, very early on, we, we saw spectacular activity, even in the dose expansion cohort. So um, a, as we continued to uh, gain information in cohorts of both IPI-treated and IPI-naive patients, uh, we observed response, the response rates that you saw, uh, about 40 percent or so, um, and had enough patients to know that the lower bound of the conference interval for that wasn't zero. Um, these were also sustained responses. Uh, um, that were also striking, uh, uh, as Jenny pointed out. This seemed to meet the notion of a substantial uh, effect size that was substantially better than available standard of care, particularly for um, the IPI treated and then subsequently, as we defined, IPI refractory patients. And so we decided to submit and, um, and we were granted that status. I will say that I, I think it um, was very helpful for us to, uh, so this was a single arm early study. It was very helpful for us to have that uh, ability to interact with FDA um, in order to accelerate 
um, additional data that the, the FDA wanted to enable an accelerated approval. Um, and this also was very helpful for us from the manufacturing perspective because it allowed also our respective manufacturing organizations to have early dialogues to ensure that um, what was be needed there uh, for FDA review as well as um, subsequently for, for patient use upon approval what was all in place. Yep. Sounds like a, a very positive experience. And uh, uh, David, yours, what, your experience is a little bit more complex. As we heard in the case, there was uh, initial denial, and then uh, you came back, that sounds like about a year later. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about, uh, about your experience. And um, um, you know, as uh, Eric said, uh, Merck had been involved in thinking about these issues and has a, had a team here uh, in, in, in Washington that's engaged in, in policy, so I kind of knew about this. Now, Ariad's a little bit newer. Uh, you have, uh, I know you've got a, another drug uh, approved, but uh, uh, sort of an earlier stage or an earlier, uh, earlier company, less experienced company. So if you could talk a little bit about that perspective, too, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, uh, as you as you pointed out, we um, we uh, have a, I think a, a bit of a unique experience, and, and maybe uh, the uh, although we were ultimately approved, uh, give, give some can give some insight into the experience with a with a compound that was initially denied a, a breakthrough therapy designation. Uh, we had uh, identified a um, population with a, with high unmet need. Um, ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer patients uh, refractory to uh, uh, to crizotinib, and um, it early uh, early on in our, our phase one experience, um, and the the majority of the patients that were uh, included in um, in the initial submission were, um, were 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 phase one dose escalation patients. Um, uh, we we saw striking striking responses and and um, and, and a uh, to the to the uh, uh, Proportion that that would would seem to indicate uh, a potential for uh, uh, a substantial uh, improvement over over current current uh, treatment. Um, uh, the the um, the number of patients uh, included in that first data set were were uh, relatively limited. Um, uh, 16, 16 uh, patients uh, uh, with a response in, in twelve to seventy five percent. We saw that as a a marked improvement, at least from a from a. Uh, early early act, signs of early activity standpoint, um, and and so we submitted uh, in that in addition with responses in in, in um, crizotinib naive patients as well, and, and so we submitted that data, um, and um, I think uh, as was as uh, Dico had has described uh, that was that was uh, 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 that submission was rejected uh, primarily with the feedback that um, the the sample size was was small. And um, the duration of follow-up um, was limited in such that the the uh, the durability of the response really really couldn't be assessed. So, um, with that feedback, we um, continued our our phase one two um, study, uh, and uh, about a year later, uh, uh, reached out to FDA and um, received some uh, uh, with with our plans for a, a resubmission and, and um, described the quality uh, of of uh, of the data. Uh, that we would be submitting and, and really ask for feedback as to whether this would meet, um, uh, would, would be supportive um, based on the, the original feedback we, we received in terms of incre increased patients and um, increased follow-up. Um, and so we submitted um, with, um, with uh, substantially about three times more patients' uh, uh, experience and, and a significant amount of, of follow-up, particularly with duration of response and PFS data, um, which, uh, which helped to support um, uh, the uh, the consistent uh, magnitude of, of response rate uh, increase and um, uh, and the durability of, of that of that response uh, and so I think this was really this experience really uh, the, with the first submission and the um, and the and the follow up submission really sort of delineates maybe a, grossly where where sort of that um, threshold lies in terms of um, in terms of the uh, preliminary data that might support a breakthrough. Designation, and, and just uh, to follow up a little bit, I mean, what I took from this is that your early experience suggested uh, you're on the right track, but needed more patience and more time to observe uh, um, uh, duration of response. Uh, did you all need feel like you needed to make any adjustments in your uh, study designs or or the like based on the early feedback, or was just it was 
it was just too early. Well, the, the, the feedback really was that it's too early and, and, and uh, really... We're but, but you're on the right track. Too early, right, but too, on the right too track. Too early and, and you're on the right track and we're looking for, for um, uh, more significant data and uh, volume of data and, and uh, follow-up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, the initial uh, rationale for submitting um, with, with the uh, significant uh, uh, or... or um, uh, with the uh, the indication that that there was uh, uh, potential for significant uh, benefit uh, or increased uh, benefit was um, was it was also it's also a while there's no um, uh, there there's no uh, approved uh, uh, drug in the in the post crizotinib space at the time of the initial um, uh, at the initial submission uh, it was a very very active it still is a very very active uh, space. Uh, in terms of the development of second generation compounds. So I think there was, there's a motivation to, um, to take advantage of a, a program like the breakthrough designation uh, therapy. And, and so I think that motivated the, the, um, uh, our participation. Yeah, this is an area where there, there has been a lot of uh, breakthrough related uh, activity, just as, there, as you said, there's a, it's, a, it's a clear unmet medical need and a lot of uh, uh, um, studies going on. Uh, and whenever you could back up a, a little bit further, um, so you all had some, the, the company is, is you know, sort of relatively speaking new, had some prior experience with FDA and it's, it's uh, prior uh, drug approval processes. Um, did you all have much guidance or interaction with FDA prior to the uh, design and submission of your initial breakthrough de designation study? Um, it, it seems like you were on, like, you, like we said, you were on the right track. And one of the issues that came up in the first session was that for many, especially smaller companies, it seems like the, the initial design issues are a problem. And uh, that doesn't seem like that was the case here. I just was trying to push on why. So I, I think really the, um, what this hinged on was, was more, better information about, uh, and better feedback, um, which we solicited from the FAA in, the, in between the, the two submissions was-, but, was but before, the, before the initial submission, mm -hmm. you had some interaction with FDA too? Not specifically on the amount of data or, mm -hmm. or, or, or sort of the threshold that would, um, uh, uh, would meet the breakthrough designation um, uh, sort of criteria in terms of the amount of, the, the, the amount of data that would, that would necessarily be, they would be looking for. And so I think, um, what was you know, certainly helpful was that feedback on the second round and potentially and initially engaging the FDA um, on, on those kind of questions before even initial submission um, would, have, would have certainly um, potentially changed uh, how we might have gone forward. And then after a breakthrough designation was granted, you mentioned that this was a, a very active area of uh, development for a, a number of companies. And uh, it sounds like you felt that the breakthrough designation and the subsequent interaction helped accelerate the process from there. Well, we certainly we certainly see that as a as a one of the key potential uh, benefits from from uh, gaining the designation is, is the increased uh, interaction with the FDA and and um, and the further development of the drug, bringing it to. Um, uh, hopefully an NDA submission. Um, George, I'd like to turn to you next. Uh, you've got obviously a lot of experience uh, in uh, uh, studies in, in, uh, in this area and uh, would like to, you know, not necessarily commenting on a particular study though, if, uh, if you could uh, uh, say a little bit about the distinctions between the or special or key features you see in these cases plus the, uh, the hypothetical denied um, uh, breakthrough case uh, and any other comments about the, the direction for the program. Well, I, I just think this is really a good session to try to put out what many of us might know in, in our hearts. The idea that having realistic and objective perspective really matters here. The experience of the companies probably matters, the experience of the investigators. But then what's fascinating, and I think the Hypothetics Inc. example might show, I wonder who they talk to, to say, let's go forward with breakthrough therapy. And had there been a big user fee as a potential disincentive, but even more important, had there been a public disclosure that Hypothetics Inc. is going forward with this as breakthrough therapy, and of course when they get denied their market capitalization is going to drop 30%, they might have been more careful about asking other experts in the field, is this, is this breakthrough? Is this, in your opinion, breakthrough? I mean, market research firms do that all the time. Academics do that all the time when they think, should we do this study? Should we do another study? We, we poll our faculty. Uh, in, in many of these cases, you, you have to wonder whether it's just um, 
let's do it. There's no barrier to doing this. It's secret if we fail. Uh, and I think that's a potential problem because I can only imagine this puts an enormous workload on some very dedicated staffers at the FDA that could get in the way of other important drugs. And, and yet people don't, might not know that. And I think that's a very critical thing. On the other hand, when it works, as it did uh, beautifully in these two examples. I think one example, you'd have to be blind not to consider these che immune checkpoint inhibitors as, as breakthrough drugs. They, they essentially, I think, define it the way the early kinase inhibitors in the right patients define breakthroughs. It's revolutionary, no question. The Ariad example, as a second generation kinase, kinase inhibitor, really represents the next challenge, which is that we are parsing the field of clinical science much more in a much more sophisticated way than I think oncology did in the 1970s. It really matters what the diagnosis is. So they nailed that about ALK positivity as a predictive marker for the drug. And then they, they recognize the fact that the alternatives do matter. Uh, and actually, I'd like to ask one question, probably of the reviewer, and one question of the company. The data you presented in the initial, I don't know, 25 patients or so, said there were no responses in the ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer patients who had already tried and failed um, the first-generation drug, crizotinib, but then also the second-generation drug, seritinib. Three patients treated, zero responses. Had there been, let's say, five patients treated and five responses in that group where there really were no other options for those patients, do you think it might have been uh, reviewed a little differently, or might you have added a few more patients to try to say, well, this is great, nothing else fits that bill? It's a hypothetical, and I know that nothing's definitive, but it, it really represents the thought process that I think breakthrough therapies have to do. They, they, they fix something that nothing else can fix in a disease that would otherwise kill somebody. David, any comments on that? Or, or, or sorry. Put so, you on the spot, sorry. No, that's okay. I mean, it's a good question, but again, it's kind of hypothetical. So when we, eva obviously, when we evaluate all these, we, we take the totality of what's actually going on. So in your si situation or in scenario when it's black and white, like you either have this drug or you die, I mean, and there's no alternatives, there's nothing, the field is just barren, then potentially we, then we would sort of um, think about it the, the way you are proposing. Um, but in general, we, you know, there's been a number of drugs, as we all know, and a number of times where we've been fooled by earlier data. So that's why we need, you know, to, 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 to kind of have a, a certainty that this is actually, we're headed in the right direction. Um, that's what I would have to add. And, and I just want to remind everyone, because before it's the hard, question... It's hard to come up with an exact it, number for that. It it yeah, it, it's about putting everything together. And, and again, it, with, as I mentioned in my presentation, with that ALK um, second generation story, there are a number of second generation ALK inhibitors. But even each one is not exactly a Me Too or a copycat drug. And there's potentially specific indications. The, the thing is, in this scenario, the, even the drug development is going a little, well, faster than potentially the science is known, actually. So we're trying to wait until the science catches up, until be, everything becomes more clear. Um, I just wanted to speak about the previous question that came up with, you know, whether Ariad had, um, you know, enough time with the FDA sort of before the first. I think we have to put things in context. Um, so a lot of... Um, especially with the first part of the, the conference, we talked about, you know, the randomized trials and for breakthrough. Um, a lot of times, at least in non-small cell lung cancer at FDA, we're dealing with, um, you know, initial studies. So, so designs actually come up at the IND state where the FDA reviews them. And then guess what? You have this great drug. Actually, you know, in the lab it worked well, and in patients it's working well. And so we, we're not even evaluating, um, we're not even at that point talking necessarily about designing randomized studies for the, or, or randomized study data. We're talking about the, even the dose finding studies and the efficacy seen on uh, phase one. Uh, David, did you want to add anything to this? I, I would just add that you know, certainly if we had, um, if we had uh, significant, uh, and the, I, I, I suppose the, the the question of at what point does you know patient number become significant to, to or uh, to submit uh, for uh, or to submit for the breakthrough therapy designation, but certainly if, if we saw that in these refractory to essentially third line patients, that would that would certainly factor in. Absolutely. 
All right, thank you. And um, Ellen, oh. to turn it to you next, so you've been involved in, as I said, in this process since uh, before the beginning as a strong advocate for patients with cancer and uh, trying to make the, the development process and the, the regulatory process that goes along with it work as effectively as possible. Um, this has been a big part of the, the, the Friends agenda and just like your perspective uh, based on the kinds of experiences we've been talking about this morning. Uh, how you think it's going? Is this uh, what you thought it might look like? And uh, how is it different? And is that, uh, is that good or bad? Well, it's a big question, yeah. long, a complicated mm -hmm. answer. So the answer is it's extraordinary and we're very, very happy. But I, and I just want to go quickly to the patient's perspective and then talk a little bit about the real history of breakthrough. So <clears throat> from a patient's perspective or an advocate's perspective, patients want things that can work. That's what they want. In these deadly diseases, they want more than hope. They want something that has a chance of working. And this is really hard because they're facing certain death, terrible pain, terrible grief. But on the other hand, it has to have a reasonable chance that it can work. And that's the complexity of this and all of this. This is what we face every day. And it's not an easy answer. I do want to spend a moment or two on the background or the history of Breakthrough because, um, and all the partners, Mark and Rick, and all of you are here in this room, you know, every year we do this Friends Brookings Conference, and it's not about just chatting, wouldn't it be nice? There's a huge amount of work that goes in it, and several years ago, I guess maybe now for Rick Pastor, who is the father of Breakthrough, uh, came to us and said, what would it be, what should we do <clears throat> if there is substantial evidence, and, uh, and it's brought to us, what should FDA do? It seemed like a logical question, but it was hard. And we had a really hard panel, and we had statisticians that uh, I want to say are from hell, or were difficult. They, it, it, it was not easy. Um, we had to have a lot of interventions from FDA, from both Rick and Janet, uh, we were very divided. Uh, patient advocates on that panel were not treated very well. And it was complicated. It was really, really complicated. Uh, in any event, we, we had somewhat of a consensus, but not as obvious as, that, as you would think. And then when Padufa came around, um, it was really Jeff Allen who really said, why don't we, there were a lot of pr proposals floating through that weren't very good, to be honest with you. Why don't we actually do something meaningful? And uh, that, again, wasn't as obvious. A lot of people wanted clean bills. They didn't really want to do, you know, touch anything, do anything. And um, but what was pretty remarkable is that all of us, including FDA, and I remember we tes testified and Janet testified at some of the hearings, and we thought maybe two drugs, maybe two drugs a year would, would come through this. So we were, you know, all shocked. It's been a seismic cultural change for patients, <clears throat> for companies, and FDA. But there aren't enough resources. This is going to be a huge issue because it works when you work closely and early with the agency. But it's going to have to really change uh, the way we are resource the agency and the way people think about it. And that includes the academics also, George. I mean, I, I still see behavior of, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, where, where everyone believes in their drug or their trial without really looking at what what's real. And certainly companies have. So I think that's important. So I want to go, because I want to do, I, I felt like I needed to say this because it was important history, but I do want to answer some of the questions that I was um, asked about these particular drugs. So, um, so I think the first one is pretty uh, easy, you know, Pem uh, Pembro. And you know, I don't really have much to, uh, to uh, offer about that. It was a pretty obvious one. Brig, I'm going to call it because I can't pronounce the full name on it. But um, that was a little bit more nuanced. And I guess the question is because uh, Zacadia was approved via accelerated rather than full approval, you know, that was not considered uh, available therapy. Um, but, and it was also very important to note that in this early trial, there was a very uh, small population, and they had to change that. So all of that is pretty um, clear. Um, the, the hypothetical, 
you know, I don't know what to say. I mean, it was pretty obvious. I mean, there's not much to say. I mean, I, you know, maybe we could, the only thing I could say is maybe we could have come up with a better hypothetical or a real example that would have been really better. Um, but I am, but I am, but I, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I speak what I think, okay. Okay, so, but, but there are other things that I do actually, questions that I do have that, um, you know, that perhaps we should think about, and I don't have the answers to it, and I bring this, you know, to, uh, in this meeting, which is really important. Should all therapies within a class, uh, uh, like ALK or PD-1, relatively quick, uh, equal effects receive breakthrough, or should only the first to market? You know, that's, those are questions we're dealing with now. Um, you know, then we're also dealing with the, uh, the PROs. I mean, if we had good PROs and we had them in, in our trials and they were meaningful and not everyone pretending they have them, I mean, that could make a huge difference in making these decisions. Um, you know, another hypothetical, you know, that we should talk about is refractory metastatic disease with no therapies where a benefit is only seen in retrospective identifi identified biomarker-defined subsets of the trial population, you know. Would that be something we should look at? You no, know, those are, you know, the retrospective subset analysis should be get, uh, granted because the apparent benefit in the population is so substantial. Questions. So those are some of the things as we go forward um, we should think about. But um, so I think the examples are good, except for the hypothetical. And um, I think the challenges in front of us are important, but I think mostly from a patient or from an advocate's perspective or for someone who cares deeply a bit about getting the right patient, the right treatment, this is terrific. Um, very proud of our role, proud to work with Mark and FDA and the agency and all those that made this happen. But I just want to say it was kind of accidental. It didn't happen easily. And Rick, had you not posed this question to us, and had we not worked really hard, um, it, we wouldn't have had breakthrough. Well, it, uh, it did, certainly didn't happen easily, uh, and it did take uh, that full collaboration, uh, not all of which went smoothly as you, uh, from the start, as you described. But it's also turned out, to, I think you were emphasizing, to be a much more widely used uh, um, uh, uh, tool in the development process than I think most anybody um, realized at the beginning. Uh, Jenny, did you want to comment on this? Um, not to toot FDA's horn or uh, Office of Oncology, but I think um, some of the benefits um, that have already been stated, but just to uh, bring it back, is that some of the benefits of the breakthrough therapy designation is that we do provide uh, frequent meetings with the sponsor and focus attention in a timely and sometimes in an informal matter. So, um, and you have a dedicated staff of experienced uh, managers and reviewers to provide input. And it's especially important like with the uh, manufacturing issues that Eric had mentioned, um, because it's on an accelerated, a faster clock that uh, the time that you would normally use in a more, um, it's more compressed in terms of scaling up for manufacturing. So I think that's one of the benefits for the breakthrough therapy designation. It's just the frequent interactions. And um, for the PEMBRO, it was approved on a surrogate endpoint and, you know, um, it's on accelerated approval, but uh, that's uh, one of the positive things about the, the breakthrough therapy is that it does make these therapies available sooner for um, an unmet uh, patient population. The clear, clear benefits, and especially as we, we've heard about uh, today, when uh, it's, it, you know it's not just the frequent interactions, but especially when the product developers are, are trying to bring all of the components of development along, including we've had some discussion around manufacturing, and, and as John suggested earlier, maybe rolling submission there at least some uh, early interaction on the manufacturing side, not just the. Uh, the, the, the studies and the product development side itself. But uh, Mark, maybe I ask you quickly, I want to go to, um, uh, to uh, Rich to talk about uh, maybe a little bit more of the big picture here. Um, your um, group has now um, gone through a number uh, of, of these, both uh, uh, breakthrough um, uh, grants and breakthrough denials. Is this now a big part of what you do, um, to, to, to Ellen's comment? <clears throat> so, so yes, it, 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 it can be. Obviously, you know, it depends on the number that we receive at any one time, and it can take a, um, you know, dedicated amount of resources to review these. You know, as mentioned earlier in the beginning of the session, all of these breakthrough uh, therapy designation requests are 
reviewed you know, by the MPs, the Medical Policy Can Council. But in addition to that, we have an internal consistency um, that is fostered through presentation of each case at the, the office level um, as well and, and at the division level earlier than that so that there are multiple rounds of input that we receive for each breakthrough therapy designation request. Um, so, you know, within each of those steps that we uh, follow as a standard uh, review of this, you know, that does take, take substantial time, you know, to prepare and, and uh, review for each. And I do want to say, oftentimes the breakthrough therapy request submission is not the end of that submission or interaction for review of that uh, request. We often will, will request additional information if necessary, such that we can make a um, you know, scientifically based decision on whether that um, product does meet the, the standards for breakthrough. So if the information is not necessarily included in the initial submission, we'll often submit information requests to gather the information that we would need to make an informed decision. All of that sounds like uh, you know, making this process uh, um, work is uh, a real commitment to making this process work well. But again, uh, it sounds like a lot of uh, a lot of the division's efforts now going into uh, breakthrough, which uh, uh, has some benefits that you've already described. But um, uh, I think Ellen also highlighted the again the, the limited resources at FDA overall. Um, so Rich, maybe I'd turn to you. Like any um, uh, overall comments on the cases that we've heard about on how um, breakthrough breakthrough is working in uh, oncology so far. I know you're part of that medical policy council that's been uh, trying to create this uh, uh, standard and consistent approach across all uh, of, uh, uh, of the, the drug evaluation process. Uh, uh, any other comments you want to add? Uh, sure. Well, uh, I'm on this panel not because I'm an expert in oncology, um, but only because I am a representative uh, on the medical policy council. Um, and, you know, I think in regards to um, Mark's uh, point, you know, th these are not just reviewed at the division or office level, but really the Medical Policy Council represents the center level. So it's a very senior management level of uh, review um, uh, and knowledge about uh, these programs. And I think that also plays an important role in, in uh, the entire process um, and, and tries to create the same consistency now from office to office to office where these um, do, in fact, uh, appear. Um, I, I also think it's important to recognize the breakthrough is not an approval. Uh, you know, so we're not looking for what requires approval. We're looking for um, meaningful data that we really truly think we have something substantially better than what's out there, at least likely to be. Um, and something that we can work with a sponsor to get to that answer as quickly as possible so that the pa so if that's true, we get it as quickly as possible to the patient. Um, so, uh, you know, and sometimes uh, we have a, a fair amount of internal debate over that substantial improvement and what that really uh, means. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, maybe it's like pornography, you know it when you see it, right? And, but it's, uh, uh, so it doesn't come usually down to this number or that number. Um, it is that totality that I think um, convinces us that we have something real. And, and so that comes down to probably most often, I would say, it is the quality of the data uh, itself that uh, truly gives us that uh, yes or no, in our opinion, um, and trying to really judge that quality. So out of the list of things that have produced denials, uh, it, um, it's, it's usually that quality issue. The, the numbers of people that were involved or subjects, you know, the duration. Um, those two things, I think, came out of our discussion this, so far in the panel as, as really important pieces of the quality. Um, how much can you put into a retrospective analysis? You know, how much can you really trust that and when it's post hoc? Um, and, and I think we've come to the decision that uh, particularly when that analysis is done in a relatively small cohort and particularly 
if it's done in a way that tries to rescue an otherwise failed study from its primary endpoint. Um, we're not convinced we can trust that, so that's not going to likely be um, a basis for which um, it will be uh, granted. Um, I would also say, uh, you know, the resource issue is, is real. You know, we, uh, I think our resources are stretched, but we truly want these things to move forward. So, you know, the all hands on deck, we now have, I think, over 80 uh, programs that have um, achieved a breakthrough designation. Uh, so that's a, a lot of hands on deck. And uh, I think, I'm sure John pointed it out earlier, but part of our reason for today is to try and improve the quality of the submissions so that those that aren't really um, going to achieve a breakthrough doesn't take up so much of the time of our uh, review staff. Um, and I think as far as our three examples today, uh, they weren't picked at random. They represent a very much a spectrum from a slam dunk uh, with Keytruda, you know, which I think it was pretty evident that there was an adequate number. There was a real difference that was present in the, in the number that was studied. Um, and there was a, a meaningful durability of what we had in front of us. Um, I think uh, the Brigatinib um, example is also extremely illustrative because it really points out that fine point of the quality of the number and duration that we look for in an oncology submission. Um, and kind of trans the transition from what wasn't enough to what was enough. Um, and you know, it was uh, essentially almost a five-fold, ten-fold difference in the number, right? Um, eventually that we uh, could see there. Um, and then the hypothetical, I'll argue with Helen just a little bit, just for fun, I, I, you know. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I did think it really does illustrate a couple of very important uh, points that um, Mark actually brought out. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it pointed out the issue of quality of data, but it really focused much more on this substantial improvement. What really was a substantial improvement? Here we had you know, um, although it looked better in some ways, um, it, it still didn't really have a um, very strong absolute difference. And that was kind of balanced and by an increased toxicity. So, you know, when you looked at that situation, maybe that wasn't enough to justify that substantial increase um, in toxicity. Um, and then finally, it also included this retrospective analysis that I was talking about where, you know, we just don't know how to trust a retrospective analysis. It's really hypothesis generating, right, rather than really giving us something that we could um, hang um, our hats on. And then finally, there was one other element that uh, sort of undermined the quality of the data that we would have looked at there, and, and that was the fact that the control arm in that small uh, cohort uh, did not perform as we would have expected it to have performed. And so whatever we did see, was it really that much better or was it because in fact we had an underperformance um, in, the, um, in the control arm of that? So um, I think the other final thing I'll say is uh, uh, the issue of an entry price. You know, maybe we have close to 300 requests I think by now uh, for this, um, and we know that there's nothing to lose by asking. Um, uh, I don't know that the right answer should be an entry price of some kind. Perhaps it should be, uh, oh, I, Kay, I, I see your face. I'm not saying that's what it should be uh, by any means. Uh, I'm just saying that perhaps it's best if there's some self-control um, in what is uh, submitted uh, for us. Say something? Yeah, go ahead, Alan. I actually agree with Rich. Maybe the example wasn't a bad one, but we. But all our children aren't beautiful. Maybe mine are, but but and and and, and we do have to re realize that we have to use this. If this mechanism is going to work, we have to resource it, resource it substantially. But we also have to uh, exercise some self-control in terms of what the standards are and what it's likely to get it, because it does and can waste a lot of time. 
I just wanted to add one important thing about um, asking for these requests, et cetera. As in the Ariad case, so the first time that it was submitted and denied, there was no conversation with the FDA. A year later, there was a conversation where we encouraged it. So, um, you know, there's always sort of a mechanism indirectly or, or informally, if you want to call it, to get in touch with the FDA prior to submitting so that the FDA can kind of give you an idea, the sponsor, an idea of whether this is the kind of data that we're looking for in order to grant breakthrough. And that's kind of a way to minimize the waste, well, the res to, to save resources for, for both the FDA and the, and the companies, actually. And, and that can be handled relatively informally, a phone call, something like that? Yeah, through the project manager. Yeah, and and just, to, just to expand upon that point, you know, in these discussions, it's clear that this is not a binding, you know, advice. It's just an informal discussion, you know, regarding the data that would be submitted. You know, sponsors are free to submit a breakthrough request irrespective of that, you know, informal discussion. Uh, maybe one other thought that I would add here, too, because we're discussing oncology and, um, and a very large amount of our breakthrough designations fall into oncology. And uh, I want to say, you know, uh, while I think we have a very um, hardworking, progressive group in oncology that, um, uh, you know, has really taken this seriously and moved it forward, um, I also think we have to recognize that um, it reflects the state of the science. And uh, the, the fact that um, we have really good drugs uh, lately for oncology that really make differences. And that even in small early uh, trials, that difference is recognizable. And that may not be so true for many other disease areas. Um, uh, and I think that accounts for um, a substantial part of why we have so many breakthroughs uh, designated now in, in that field. That's a good comment and, and something we'll come back to in the later panels as well. George? Yeah, I, I was going to make that very point. I think what we're seeing is something we couldn't have imagined. We could have hoped, but we couldn't have imagined some of the mechanistic successes of oncology research, which is really a reflection of the country's investment in cancer research that we hope will show up in neurology, in metabolic disease, and all sorts of other areas. But at this point, I would say oncology is leading the way. I also do agree with what Ellen said about the academic self-delusion as well as potentially the potential for industrial self-delusion of Lake Wobegon Biopharma saying all of our drugs are better than you know, the average. And, and that level of self-control is, I, I actually think Ariad should be praised for being willing to come forward today and say, yeah, we tried, it failed, we ultimately did it. Because conceivably, you could have just quashed that. Conceivably, you could have said, well, that was all discussion under our confidential NDA, and we don't have to talk about that. We got our breakthrough designation eventually. The fact that we couldn't get one other company to come forward and say, we tried, we failed, let's be honest about this. Let's open this up so others can learn from this is really a challenge. I know that's probably naive, but it would be nice if we could do that. I would like to open this up to further discussion with all of you here in the room. So again, uh, if you have a comment or question, uh, please uh, uh, please head up to the to the microphone. We we do have some time uh, for for that uh, discussion now. And we just kind of highlight uh, just you know a couple of points that I've taken away from this is if if you're a sponsor. Uh, there are some key issues to pay attention to, whether you call that uh, self-control or otherwise, but uh, an area like uh, on oncology, there are a lot of cases of serious disease where the ex existing treatments are not so good, um, but it is worth uh, being clear before bringing something forward what the uh, alternative treatments are in your clinical area not counting, I guess, accelerated approval and treatments in development, but then especially uh, uh, paying attention to uh, issues around uh, the uh, quality of the evidence being developed. Uh, is it enough patients? Is it long enough? Uh, are you confident that you've got a good, uh, uh, um, hopefully prospective uh, uh, study design, things like that that have come up, uh, come up already? Uh, Kay, please go ahead. Uh, so actually two questions, one really a short one and the other one may be just a ponderous one. Um, and that, if people have alluded to the fact that oncology is a rather unique therapeutic area for a lot of reasons, one of which is that 
it is a scary diagnosis. Uh, it used to be the most scary. I think it's second to Alzheimer's disease now. But um, and, and there's no question about whether cancer is a serious or life-threatening illness. But in many other therapeutic areas that when we look at the statistics on breakthrough, we see that they are all falling behind oncology, hematology, and virology. In those other therapeutic areas that don't hit the high notes, how are um, FDA reviewers and how is the Medical Policy Council looking at the question, not of substantial improvement, but of serious illness? So how does FDA define for these therapeutic areas that aren't so obvious as oncology, what is a serious illness, which is the first criterion by which we're going to judge whether something could qualify as a breakthrough therapy. And, uh, it looks like uh, Kay is looking at you, Rich, for that one. I would just point out that we are going to come back to a more detailed discussion of Later. many of these yeah. other areas after yeah. lunch today. So um, I actually think we've defined serious in our guidance. Um, I think if you look in there, I don't have the words right in front of me, but I think it, there is a definition. Um, but uh, I would actually say that in the submissions that I've seen, um, I would say that we've only determined that the disease was not serious less than 5% of the time. You know, 95%, I think, we've agreed that it's a very serious problem. So I don't think that's the burden here. Okay. I don't think that's really uh, the, the main issue. Um, that seems to usually come to a good agreement. And I'd even say that uh, the MPC ends up agreeing with the review division probably at least 80% of the time, if not more. Um, so while we try to make sure there's a consistency, and, and that isn't just oncology, that's, you know, all the other divisions, too, that come to us uh, with a potential breakthrough. Um, they've usually done a good job, and I think everybody's learned over two years now. Um, and so I think the consistency is increasing uh, more and more as we've all had the chance to share and talk, and, and the divisions have sort of seen what the MPC thinks. So. I think, you know, we're getting closer and closer to a real consistency. Uh, and the second question is a very small process question, and I ask it on behalf of companies who have little or no regulatory experience, because we saw the numbers that show us that companies who have a lot of regulatory experience tend to do better, which makes perfect sense. So if these companies believe they have something that could qualify, who is it that they call? Do they call the review division that they will end up in? Is that their first stop at the FDA for that first conversation? So, um, go ahead. So the the breakthrough you know therapies are for drugs that you know would have preliminary clinical evidence. So typically they have an ongoing IND, and I can say f this is what has been done in oncology uh, in OHOP. This may not be applicable to other, you know, divisions or centers, but, but it's typically initiated through a phone call or, or some sort of communication with the regulatory project manager that's managing that IND. Okay. Thank you. Rich, is that how it's, is that how it's generally? Uh, yes, I, absolutely. I think that's how it's generally done. I, I will just add to Kay's comment, though, that um, I, I missed the beginning of today's meeting uh, because I had to speak at an orphan drug conference. And um, I was deluged with questions afterwards that certainly suggested that many people who had small companies there didn't have a clue and really needed regulatory input. So, so when, you're, uh, when you have that contact with the IND, if you're a small company, um, that's going to help you set up your initial clinical trials and, and give you the opening and, and the start of a relationship that you could use for that informal feedback on when and whether you're, you're ready through, for a breakthrough application. Correct. And, and potentially even earlier at a pre-IND phase, you know, we do have those discussions depending where along the clinical development that product has already proceeded either 
internationally or you know, perhaps under a different IND and then that um, drug may be developed in a specific indication. So there are definitely many different opportunities for discussion with the agency regarding trial design issues and, and other you know, drug development questions. And David, that seemed to work for you, the study design that you had from the beginning, sort of post IND, uh, was one that basically worked for the breakthrough designation and just needed to get to more clarity about what was the uh, appropriate level of evidence. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, Bob? <coughs> uh, Bob Temple. Um, as we heard, uh, companies that have been turned down are unwilling to reveal the reasons for it or our basis for it, so our only source is the hypotheticals. And I want to uh, ask a few questions about the hypothetical. I think Rich started to do this, but I think it's important to understand why you think that needed to be turned down. So one thing is the tumor response rate was uh, 20%. Um, was that critical? It wasn't very high. Uh, or was it the fact that the chemo Y, which, w which has uh, been effective in the past in, in controlled trials, didn't have any effect in this study, and that led to suspicion. It, it's important to understand these nuances for people who are submitting. So if the, if the tumor response rate isn't you know, really good, like 50%, 60%, like some of the directed ones, is that a discouraging move, uh, even though they did clearly show a, a nominally significant uh, uh, progression advantage over the standard of care? So say a little more about what led to the conclusion. Sure. Um, appreciate that opportunity. And I think this actually does highlight, you know, even though it may on the outside look like a slam dunk denial and a bad case, it's actually these cases that generate a lot of discussion at the office level, at the medical policy council level, because there are often, and, and it's not an amalgam of cases where there was a one design flaw that we pulled from multiple different cases. And I think as was shown this morning, there are multiple trial design issues that often you know, lead to a denial. But specifically for, for this case, uh, the nuances, as you point out, would be partly the what represents substantial you know, improvement in general. Um, and that's modulated by the, you know, the disease, the available therapies, and whatnot, but as you pointed out, the, the specific case demonstrated a control arm which well underperformed, you know, compared to historical, you know, data with that control. So it, it's a multitude of, of issues that are looked at in the totality of the data, you know, which end up being uh, evaluated in determining whether or not, you know, the trial provides that, you know, scientifically reliable uh, preliminary clinical evidence to make that judgment that something you know is substantial above and beyond the 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 magnitude that's demonstrated. So other issues that this case pointed out was the fact for a progression-free survival, the subgroup analyses looking at relevant subgroups were not consistently in favor of the combination arm for hypothetics, for example. So we have a you know we have multiple guidances. Um, as everyone knows, but there's a clinical trials guidance regarding the quantity of evidence that's necessary for submission of a clinical trial um, for, you know, approval based upon an adequate and well-controlled, you know, single trial. And some of those issues are some things that we would look at for the reliability of evidence from a single trial evaluation, such as uh, consistency amongst um, relevant subgroups and subgroup analyses conducting really multiple trials within the same trial, for example. So some of the other efficacy endpoints which were demonstrated may not have met the um, level of being superior you know, to the single agent arm, such as the overall survival Thanks. example. So there's multiple uh, facets of clinical trial, and, and there's, you know, these are, as you're pointing out, often the um, uh, trials that will be discussed, not necessarily virtually, when we see subgroup analyses as well, that are you know more you know, demonstrate a, a larger magnitude of a potential uh, uh, preliminary evidence of of uh, an effect on a clinical endpoint you know, that would so, be potentially so the, meaningful. The lack of an effect on overall survival would be an inhibition would be inhibitory for breakthrough, right? 
No, not I mean, that necessarily. doesn't keep not, drugs not from at being all. That's just that's just one example of a endpoint. Uh, for example, at ORR, okay. you know, the objective response rate may not have been different uh, between the two when tested statistically. You know, those sorts of issues. But overall survival, given its trial size, you know, would be difficult to make any comments on. But what was not seen was a dramatic difference in overall survival. For example, you know, right. if that had been seen, you know, the number of patients needed to demonstrate a large effect, you know, is obviously less than a smaller okay, so, effect. Okay, so just to press it, the things that led to not agreeing uh, for breakthrough here was, was the modest response rate, the funny performance of the standard of care, which was well under what it usually does, uh, and stuff like that. The subgroup, I had a further question. I couldn't, I'm not sure I could tell this. We would never let a study that failed be salvaged by looking at a subgroup. That is not quite the same as saying that within a study that won, which this did, you might not be able to look at a subgroup. Just something. Well, for I was, was going to push on that point in particular. I know, um, Rich, you've got to, uh, and George both have further comments on this. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't hear anything, and you know, I, I know this is this is a totality issue, and, and we've talked about some some key dimensions uh, and uh, the, the key issues within those dimensions. But if I didn't hear anything that, that seemed like a, 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 a bright line, it was uh, uh, not supporting these kinds of retrospective subgroup analyses uh, that are sort of based on convenience, especially, as you said, when a study just didn't work overall. I mean, is that is that a bright line? Right. So, I mean, as uh, Bob Temple mentioned, that's, you know, partly, you know, the bright line there. But but the, the things that were not, you know, we only have a certain amount of time, obviously, to present these cases, but things to think about when we're looking at subgroup analyses of a, from a overall larger trial was, you know, how many patients have been evaluated, for example, for that biomarker of the total trial. Was that biomarker prospectively assessed and used as a stratification uh, variable, for example, in the randomization process such that you could potentially look at that subgroup in a trial that won overall? And very importantly is how reliable is the assay that's identifying those patients of that particular subgroup? So there's multiple um, multiple issues that need to be evaluated when we're looking at biomarkers, and those are just to name a few. Okay, I'd like to go to Rich and then uh, George. So Bob knows the answers to all these things that were rhetorical questions. It's, it's still yeah. good questions to bring up. But, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I think it was the multiplicity of the issues that would sink, you know, that hypothetical. I don't know that that alone was the, was the, the death knell for, uh, for breakthrough on on that one, um, uh, because it was clearly more complicated, as you said, Bob. I, I think one last observation I'd like to maybe add, too, is that, you know, if you don't get breakthrough, that's not the end of the road, right? Uh, you know, you still can have very good drugs that add to the armamentarium uh, that, while they might not show a substantial improvement, they can be useful and, uh, and can be developed further and should be uh, if there are, in fact, uh, uh, effective, and I, I, when I think back to close to two years ago, when all of this was still earlier for us, we had a lot of MPC discussions over this, over the issue of, we saw a drug that looked like it had an effect very early, and we were convinced it was effect. The, uh, the whole thing came back to this idea of what is a substantial improvement, not just an effect uh, that could eventually be approved. I was going to make that exact same point. It seems as if if you don't get breakthrough, you failed. But I suspect that hypothetics could still be an important drug. It just takes the standard route to approval. The other problem with the substantial language, and this gets to interactions with our patients and our advocates, is that a patient might look at that and say, that's substantial to me. And that's a problem with language. I think that's why we're having this meeting. At the break, I had a nice discussion with the father of the Breakthrough Therapy Act, right, Dr. Pazder, and he, he used a very good phrase that I've heard him use before. Is it transformative? Is this transformative activity? I know that's not the legislated language, but that's good language to keep in mind uh, as we look at what's a realistic thing. And I actually think we're exploring the nuances of this case that we dissed earlier, and I think this hypothetical case actually had a lot of nuances in it, including the fact that Nobody could look at that as transformative because the activity, if there, looked about the same as chemotherapy Y from the 90s. Now, that's not saying it might not be approved. It might still be a helpful agent, 
but I think it doesn't fit the breakthrough therapy designation. I think that was a very useful and a very thoughtful example. Thanks. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, Andrew Slug from Ariad, and I realize I'm standing between everyone and lunch, so okay. I'll be brief. Um, I was hoping to ask the FDA panelists regarding how they address the qualifying criteria over the drug's life cycle. Um, it would seem to me in oncology where several drugs are granted accelerated approval, which then convert to regular approval, um, the standard of care and available therapy is pretty dynamic, um, and that changes on a regular basis. How does the MPC, um, the division, and the office address that dynamic uh, situation? Thank you. We could start, we could start with the division, if you like. Sure. So from, a, from the division perspective, I'll, I'll start off, um, or my personal perspective on this is that you're right, the available therapy that we consider when we're assessing breakthrough does change, and that assessment has to be a continual assessment. So, for example, um, an available therapy, which uh, Dico had mentioned, a, a product that's granted accelerated approval is not considered an available therapy for which you know, we would consider um, comparing that to when evaluating whether there's substantial improvement. So that's an important distinction that we make um, regarding the uh, newest products that often will come out in an accelerated approval as opposed to a uh, regular approval. Um, but, but it's essential the, the, the evaluation is one that is taken with each application at, at that time. Uh, we assess the available therapies for the field, not necessarily the available therapies that were uh, for the last uh, breakthrough request or the one before that. It's, it's continually updated based upon the uh, treatment landscape for that individual disease or, and potentially that subset you know, or subgroup of patients depending on biomarker for that disease. You know, um, I think that was one of the main points in the presentation about, um, about brigatinib was this fact that there was another good drug, uh, but it was under accelerated approval, and we didn't hold um, brigatinib to uh, feet to the fire over a comparison with that other drug that was also available. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, that's, that is a, a main point. But I, I will say that I've been in discussions uh, in the MPC where our knowledge of other agents in development that have, you know, even substantially better responses sometimes tempers how we look at that substantial improvement. Um, I, I think, or it has, I, I just think that's an honest truth that, um, that uh, I've experienced. Um, but of, we don't generally uh, tr try to uh, let that influence us. Just uh, a quick follow-up. Uh, are there any cases, or, or could you imagine a case where a breakthrough designation is granted, then the field changes uh, during the breakthrough process uh, where it could be removed? Yeah, yeah. Mark, that, that was actually the, the gist of my question, okay. was how does that, once a, you know, I think we're, we're viewing this as a kind of a, you know, a binomial um, process whereby a drug gets granted breakthrough therapy, you know, it's a continual process, and that could speak to some of the resource concerns over the long haul of how, how these applications have to be continually reviewed. So um, I'd be interested in, in understanding how new drug applications in a ev fastly evolving uh, area would, um, would, would be considered uh, based on the existing breakthrough therapies for that indication. So you mean when that accelerated approval becomes a full approval? Yes, and then how, how does, is there a reassessment of other drugs that are granted at breakthrough therapy? Have been granted yeah. breakthrough. So, yeah, I know John wants to answer this. <laughs> yeah. How could we, you we tell? Made clear, we made clear in the guidance that breakthrough was at the moment of the designation, and it can be withdrawn later if the circumstances change. It can be that the drug itself doesn't live up to its promise, mm -hmm. It, with subsequent studies, it could be withdrawn for that reason. But it could also be withdrawn if the field changes. And I think the best example of that that I mentioned already this morning was hepatitis C. I'm not going to remember the names. I, both Ceprevir and Telaprevir, I think, were the ones we approved, what, four or five years ago for hepatitis C. We didn't have breakthrough then, but they would have been breakthrough if we had breakthrough then because they were substantially more effective than interferon and ribavirin. They're not even on the market today. So we've, we've had to look at the changing landscape. So you know we've recently proposed withdrawal 
some breakthrough therapy designations for hepatitis C drugs because they no longer uh, met that definition. So we do, we do need to do that. Some of the cases in oncology get complicated because the confirmatory trials that lead to full approval are in a different phase of the disease than what the breakthrough therapy designation was for. So breakthrough may have been a refractory patient population. The full approval may come in first line or second line. So it, you have to look at the nuance. But yes, we do look at that as far as deciding whether to retain the designation. Thanks. Thanks. A uh, very quick final comment from Ellen. I just want to say, initially when we did breakthrough, people said, you don't need it. The FDA can do it anyway. Well, the truth of the matter is, is it changed the field, revolutionized the field and the thinking, and we know we have metrics on time and the way people think. So it was an, inc an incredible uh, uh, tool and is, and we have to be thoughtful about how to use it. But in fact, all these drugs that were uh, a given breakthrough designation probably would have gotten approval, but not in the same hands on deck, not with priority setting, and not with the focus on how to do it and how to do it thoughtfully so we can get to patients in a timely basis. And we can't forget that. Thanks. I think that's a good point to end this session on. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for an uh, excellent discussion of uh, breakthrough issues around